Hi friends, I hope you're all doing well. I'm so glad to be able to share this spiritual practice with you. As we begin, I invite you to get comfortable. Take a moment to feel your groundedness on the earth, the life flowing into you through your breath, and the awareness in your own consciousness. Relax, still your body and mind, and open yourself to spirit in whatever way is helpful for you. Feel free to pause the video until you feel ready to dive into the work of today's practice. And then when you're ready, invite images into your mind of the world as you see it now. Don't try to control or judge those images. Just let them flow into your awareness. Note them for a moment and then release them to make space for the next image. When you feel that you've done this enough, take a few moments to collate your images into a one sentence story that reflects how you feel about the world now. You can write the story down in your journal or on your phone, or you can just let the words flow through you. But once again, don't judge. Don't, don't judge your story. Don't try to fit it into any external standard to which you may be tempted to conform. Just allow the story to emerge. And then when you've got your one sentence story in front of yourself, ask yourself what you would want to change about your story of the world. Where do you fit into the story? What impact does the story have on your life? And what would you prefer to be different? Sit with your thoughts and feelings for a moment and then invite the Divine Spirit to ignite your imagination as we begin to explore what a different story might look like. And this prayer may be helpful to you. Spirit of God, fill my eyes with a vision of your dream for my world. Fill my mind with the wisdom to see how that dream may become a reality. And fill my being with the courage and strength to do what it takes to live in your country, even as I live in the ordinary world. So may it be. About a week ago, I was driving down a road when I saw a series of signs. The writing was blood red on a black background, never a good sign. And the messages felt like they came from a bygone era. I don't remember the exact wording. I really wish I'd taken some photographs. But every sign, its message was in the vein of repent or perish. And to finish the picture, after driving past these threatening messages, there was a man carrying a sandwich board, warning everyone that the end is near. I've always been fascinated by people whose view of the gospel, which is supposed to mean good news, contains such angry and threatening messages. I wonder whether they really believe that anyone will change because of their signs and shouting. And I've come to the conclusion that many of them believe that they're continuing the tradition of the Old Testament prophets, particularly the prophecies about the great and terrible day of the Lord. But the day of the Lord is much more than hellfire and brimstone. We'll talk about that a bit more in a moment. In our last series, we spoke about how we assess whether our spirituality is healthy and life-giving or not. And I mentioned that one of the primary measures I use is Jesus' image of the kingdom of God. Some writers moving away from the patriarchal and monarchical language of kingdom have chosen to use other words, the kingdom of God, the reign of God, 
or my personal favorite, the commonwealth of God. But whatever languaging you might use there, unfortunately, there's still a lot of misunderstanding of what Jesus actually meant. See, for a large proportion of the Christian population, the kingdom of God or the kingdom of heaven, as Matthew refers to it in his gospel, is the place we go when we die. It's synonymous with heaven, this place of bliss and everlasting life that we're supposed to go to in the afterlife. But that's not at all what Jesus was talking about. And so in this series, I want to invite us to take a trip into the commonwealth of God. A trip into God's country, if you like. I want to uncover the Old Testament foundations that informed Jesus' metaphor and then see how he developed those ideas in his own life and preaching. And finally, we'll see what all of this means for us. And to do this journey, we're going to use three primary lenses from the Old Testament. The Day of the Lord, the Jubilee, and the restoration of the kingdom to Israel. Which brings us back to our conversation about the prophetic message of the great and terrible day of the Lord. That particular phrase comes from the prophet Joel. When Joel preached during a time of great turmoil in Israel, it was either a a literal plague of locusts or some military invasion that he described like a locust swarm. He warned the people that this was God's judgment on their wickedness, but he also promised restoration and healing, as all the prophets did. See, at its heart, the vision of the day of the Lord was a dream of hope. Israel spent most of its history oppressed, either by corrupt leadership or by enemy nations that conquered and occupied the land. But the people of Israel believed they were God's chosen people, and so they were confused that God will allow them to suffer so much. And into this turmoil, the prophets spoke of a time when God would bring all nations together in peace and harmony. In one of my favorite Old Testament passages, the prophet Isaiah described it in this way. I'm going to quote from Isaiah. In the last days, the mountain of the Lord's house will be the highest of all, the most important place on earth. It will be raised above the other hills, and people from all over the world will stream there to worship. People from many nations will come, and they will say, Come, let us go up to the mountain of the Lord, to the house of Jacob's God. There he will teach us his ways, and we will walk in his paths. For the Lord's teaching will go out from Zion. His word will go out from Jerusalem. The Lord will mediate between nations and will settle international disputes. They will hammer their swords into plowshares and their spears into pruning hooks. Nation will no longer fight against nation, nor train for war anymore. And Isaiah also spoke about lions and lambs lying down together, children playing near the burrows of snakes without fearing harm, And God, as the benevolent ruler, offering grace, comfort, protection, and peace to the entire world and all its human and non-human creatures. The day of the Lord, and also the phrase, the last days, was shorthand to describe the hope of the prophets that an era would come when the world would leave its violence and division behind and embrace peace, healing, and kindness. This is very different from the turn or burn message of the man with his sandwich board. 
It's not about some dramatic second coming of Jesus that destroys the world and sends all sinners to hell. And it's not about the afterlife. It's about this world, this life, evolving under the Spirit's direction into a place of wholeness and unity where everyone has a place, everyone is valued, and everyone is safe. What would it mean to you to live in a world like this? What would you need to do to help make a world like this a reality? How can you allow this dream to shape how you think, what you hope for, how you relate to others, and how you live in the world? Well, stay tuned for the next chapter, where we explore what Jesus did with this image of the day of the Lord. Return to that space of groundedness and stillness that you were in at the start of this practice. Allow a few moments for this reflection to sink into your heart and take note of anything that stood out for you, that challenged you or inspired you. Now go back to the story you wrote in the beginning of this practice. Compare it to the dream that we've just been talking about. And now I encourage you to write another story about the world. This time, make it a little longer, maybe one or two paragraphs. And describe the world as you would like it to be. Keep in mind how you see the world now as expressed in the short story you wrote earlier. And also keep in mind the dream that we've explored in today's reflection. And try to make this new story that you're writing now realistic and practical, but also hopeful and filled with possibilities. And again, you can pause the video if you need a while to do this. And when you're done writing your new story about the world, make sure to keep it somewhere close to you so that you can return to it throughout the week, so that you can allow it to fill your heart and mind with its inspiration. And now as we prepare to return to the practical details of living, take a moment to identify one thing you can do to live as if your hopeful story of the world was a reality now. Think of one thing that can move you a little closer to making this dream real for you and commit to doing that thing as consistently as you can through the week. See yourself living in this new world of your story. Imagine making the habits and feelings and attitudes of your story the way you actually live now. Even though your world, the, the, the one you're really in right now, may be very different from the one you've been imagining. And now go into your week to live in God's country, even as you live in our ordinary world.